I will consider this talk to have been a success if at the end of it you both understand something that's really not that complicated, find yourself wondering why it's taken us until now to articulate something that's not very complicated, and also all end up wanting this thing to get adopted as much as I do. Um, just as Dan was finishing his talk, uh, I uh, got my boarding pass for Southwest Airlines 24 hours before I'll be flying back tomorrow, um, and it was on my phone. Um, and I know that the gate will accept the, the, the barcode, but I wasn't so sure about the burly TSA guy that would let me through security. So I thought, okay, I have to get this printed somehow. So I walked across the hall here to the little business center and confronted this you know, alien computer that had a printer connected to it, so that was hopeful, and began to try to figure out what was the least amount of information I had to give it in order to somehow get my boarding pass printed on the printer. Um, there didn't seem to be any way to get it out of the phone, so I just, you know, I clenched and went to Southwest's website and logged in. Now, I don't know my password because you shouldn't know your passwords anymore, unfortunately. Um, so I looked it up using a password manager and carefully typed in about 16 digits and, you know, I'm horrified at the idea that I'm entering, I'm like, I'm logging into a computer I have no knowledge or control over, but I have to. And I, so I told myself, okay, at least, you know, I will immediately change the password after I'm done. So I did get my printout and I logged off and I was, I was glad to see that the system rebooted afterwards. So maybe they've got some state saving thing where it starts fresh every time and so hopefully it's forgotten me. I did, however, change my password nonetheless. Um, if I had this technology that I'm going to explain, uh, which is open, free, available, uh, it actually exists. There's an Android client uh, running it now. I'm finishing up a Windows client. There's about 15 projects over on GitHub for various server-side and client-side platforms. Um, if I had it, Southwest would have presented me with a little QR code next to my login name and password. And I would have snapped that with my phone, and the phone would have confirmed that I wanted to log into Southwest, which prevents one type of exploit. Uh, I would have said yes to the phone, and without typing anything on the keyboard, because of course there could still be a keystroke hardware logger in line on the keyboard that grabbed my password and some evil person's gonna suck it down later. But without me touching the machine at all, just, just clicking on the page, I'm then logged in using this technology. Um, that was the way I originally conceived of this about a year ago, thus the QR in the middle, secure QR code login. Um, but then, in thinking about it a little bit more, I realized that if you wrap a, an image, like of a QR code, in an HTML href tag, then it, the image becomes clickable. Um, which means that at home, on a machine that I do trust, but I, like, I have an identity on login on, on websites all over the internet, at home, I click the QR code with my mouse and the client, the Windows client or Mac or Android or whatever, the link is sqrl colon slash slash whatever in the same way that you know you have mail to links where you click on a mail to link and up pops your email client because the OS understands that that scheme is registered to that piece of hardware or that, that, that piece of software. So um, you click the QR code and again, a little dialogue pops up from the client confirming that you want to authenticate to this site. You say yes, and it's done. So, so what I'm proposing, what this system is, is a complete replacement of usernames and passwords for authentication. Um, 
Uh, and this is sort of the generic outline of any talk of this sort, so I won't go, <laughs> I won't go through that. Um, and I, was, I wanted to, I thought as I was putting these slides together, is there any way for me to begin a talk about authenticating on the internet without talking about how bad it is? But, and I realized walking across the hall, I just did that. So, and my, besides, we all know how bad it is. We should not be using the same password for multiple sites. We shouldn't know our passwords anymore. The, the onus is on us to, to manage our identities. And websites have proven themselves notoriously awful at keeping our secrets for us. And so they're escaping all the time for, for you know, disastrous consequences. So none of this has changed since you know, the very first time people were logging into mainframes with a terminal. All we did was remote it and didn't upgrade the technology in any way. So this stuff is old. Um, we're familiar with what I just described is a, a two-party authentication system using a username and password. Um, they're, they're ad hoc. We know that not all websites are good trustees of, our, of, our, of what is essentially our information that we've given it, a way of identifying ourselves to it, so it escapes. Lots of poor implementations. Increasingly, we hope that they're hashing them and they're using a good hash and they're, they're using a password-based key derivation function to make it difficult to create you know, lookup tables and so forth. But, but still, this stuff is broken. Now, an alternative is, uh, and you see, there have been some efforts at this, a, the three-party systems, where you have some sort of federated identification system. I've attended a couple of identity conferences where there was some a venture capitalist who was financing his own solution to this, and we all had to, some, you know, one way or another, he was saying, oh, it's all free for end users. Well, okay, except that you know, he's trying to make money on this. One of the things that I think is clear is that authentication is just too big. It's, it's too ubiquitous, it's too important. It has to be free. It's not something that anybody can own. So, so I think that's one of the reasons that we, we've, we've sort of been stuck with usernames and passwords for so long, is that it is free, it is obvious, it takes no training or, or you know, particular acumen in order to use it. Unfortunately, it's also really bad. But the problem is, in this post Edward Snowden era, I don't think any kind of a third party system makes sense. Um, the advantage of a third party is that there's someone that you can go to if you get in trouble, if you forget what your password for them is, or if you lose your credentials somehow. So, so the, the advantage of a third party is that there's some recourse, um, but the problem is it, now in this era, we have to trust them, and that seems that you know, less and less likely to happen. Um, so the, the solution that we want will not be a profit center. It's completely open. Uh, it wants to be understandable, clean and simple, have a straightforward, easily understood security model, uh, and wants to be easy to implement. Uh, I chose standard crypto off the shelf that as far as we know has no intellectual property complications. Uh, Dan mentioned uh, Daniel Bernstein um, and, and, uh, as being the, the solution for fast signing of things and I'm using the, the Bernstein's elliptic curve crypto library which is what DNS crypt is based on and, you, and uh, I'm seeing more and more instances of, pe of people picking up on it. It's the, the EC25519 elliptic curve and it's just, I mean it's like this dream solution for crypto. Um, and a solution has to have low friction adoption. I think that's crucial. And um, this is my first presentation about Squirrel. I've been working on it for a year, uh, nailing down all the details. Because what I'm going to give you in the next slide or two is something that's sort of obvious and simple. But as always, the devil is in the details. And there are some edge cases that we need to handle. Because this is a two-party system where the user is ultimately responsible for managing their identity, and not all users are equally competent at doing that. So there, there needs to be some system for providing some recourse in the event of them losing credentials. 
So, how does this thing work? The next slide after this one shows a simple picture of what is essentially the entire architecture. I'll go back though and say that the way this works is that the, the user's client, when you download this on Android or on Windows or Mac, it, and it, it runs under Wine and Linux, and I'm sure there will be some native implementations soon. Uh, people are working on them. Uh, it generates one 256-bit, which is really big and big enough. That's what like a Bitcoin ID is. And as Dan says, it is not difficult to get really good random numbers anymore. There's all kinds of good ways to do that. So it generates one 256-bit master token. That is, that is your identity potentially for life. For, I mean, literally, if you, if you don't do something stupid, and there are, there are actually ways to recover from stupidity, which I'll, I'll discuss, but you, you potentially only need this one thing forever. Um, and the client helps you make a paper copy, print it out so that you're able to, you know, if your device melts down, you're able to recover it. The idea is that, that that's your master key. Then the website domain that you're logging into is, is hashed with that master key. That, that master key keys an HMAC, and the, the domain name of the website is hashed through that to generate a private key. What's so cool about, this, about elliptic curve crypto, unlike the traditional RSA crypto where we take two prime numbers and multiply them, and the, and the, the hard thing about, about RSA, about the, this prime math, is that, as we all know, it's difficult to perform a prime factorization. That's, there's no way to unmultiply the numbers in, in any practical time. But what that means is that the, the crypto is not easily deterministic. Uh, elliptic curve crypto is, which is to say that we're able to feed the master key and the domain name through a hash, and the result with a little bit of tweaking of bits in order to make it a valid private key. But, but out of 256 bits, you, you, we, have to, we have to just change a couple of them, and we end up with a private key which never leaves the client. The, the beauty of that is, is now we have a per site private key generated from our single master identity. So we do two things with that. That we run it through a function that makes that into a public key, and that's fast and easy, and that becomes the, our identity for that site. That is, it is it's a, a random looking token, it's also 256 bits, um, and it is, it is both the public key that matches the private key, and that's the way the site knows us. So the system is pseudonymous. Um, unless we associate it with our real world identity, we're completely anonymous to the site. Um, and since every domain name is gonna hash to something, to a different private key, and that's gonna have a correspondingly different public key, we have a different identity for every site, so we can't be tracked across sites. Then what happens with this QR code is that this is a so-called, in, in crypto terms, a nonce. Every time the Southwest Airlines, in my ideal world, uh, website displays one, it's different. It, it's just a, a different QR code. Encoded in that is some information. There's a, a, a timestamp, the IP that we're connecting from, um, uh, maybe some, some session logon information. Basically, it's, it's free format. There, there's no fixed format for, for this. What we need it to be is unpredictable and, non, and not repeated, and that's easy to do. We, we add some you know, internet time to it and a monotonically increasing counter, and it's never gonna generate the same one twice. The point is that every time that the logon page is displayed, a different QR code comes up, and our client, 
whether it's this cross logon model where you snap it with your phone and so your phone becomes your authenticator or the same the same client logon where you click the QR code and a client wh which is running there picks up the SQRL scheme and, and responds. It simply synthesizes, it knows where you are because that's in the URL, synthesizes on the fly the private key. So you don't need per site storage. It's all generated on the fly. It, it then sends back the public key which is how the site knows you, and uses the private key to sign that URL, which it also sends back. So what comes back to the server is the, this URL that it just recently sent out into the world onto some random you know, request for a logon page. It comes back signed cryptographically with a public key. Well, the signature was made with a private key that we know corresponds to the public key. So it gets the public key and verifies that it was signed correctly. So that tells the server that the person that just sent this back with, its, with their public key just signed a unique bunch of gibberish that's, that's never been seen before correctly which means they have the private key. And then it looks up in its database who, who is associated with this public key, and now you're authenticated. So it's like, this works. Um, you know, this, this is a, like, it, it, it's a, a simple, tight solution that allows us to have a single identity, not be trackable across the internet. Um, it's cryptographically sound. Um, and solves the problem that we all have. So we're per site pseudonymous. We get unique identifier, uh, identifiers synthesized for us for every site. And notice that we've given the web server, unlike usernames and passwords, no secrets to keep. If it wanted to, it could publish the public keys, which is the way that site identifies us. They're meaningless for, for any other website because any other website is going to generate a different private key through that hash and thus a different public key. So we're not requiring the server to keep any secrets for us. We're just saying, this is who we are for you. And if they, if, if, if they can't keep it a secret, well, it doesn't really matter to us because it doesn't do anybody else any good. Um, and the fact that, we're, that it's generating this unique token every time means that we're proof against any re reuse and replay attacks. And encoded into that could be, as I said, a, a timestamp. So it knows, for example, wait a minute, this thing that's coming back now is an hour old. Let's just ask the person to refresh the web page and get a new one because this seems a little suspicious. I mean, not that there's a problem with it, but we, we have that kind of control. Um, and as I mentioned, there's two compatible modes of operation. Oh, I didn't mention that, um, that the Squirrel clients all are able to share this super secret master key. So you, the first time you use Squirrel, downloading it from, you know, on whatever platform you choose, you're able, that's where it generates this single master identity. You're then able to export that to all your other devices and platforms. So that single identity for you is able to, to operate across any platforms you have and run in a compatible fashion. So, um, so you don't need separate, device, separate identities per device. Um, my client that I've written for Windows is nearly done. Um, I'm actually working now on the server side stuff. Uh, it's at Geo, all of this stuff, documentation for the protocol, all of the details for implementing it is at grc.com. And I'll have the system running probably about a week from now for people who want to download it. I've, cr I've created a, 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 a little squirrel login facility where you can create an identity, you can associate yourself, you can give the account a name, and just sort of, sort of play with it. Uh, the, this, the system does support multiple different identities so that it's compatible, for example, with a shared computer in a household where, you know, mom and dad and Johnny and Susie all want to share this, uh, a, a single machine. There's one need we still have because essentially what we've done is we've, we've 
given this client the ability to stand in for us. It's now our authenticator. So we still have the problem of, our th of authenticating ourselves to it. Um, probably Touch ID um, and a, a simple, easy to use biometric solution is, a, is enough, like maybe now, or uh, certainly as we, as, as we grow to, to trust that technology more. Um, for the time being, for example, in a Windows mode, um, I'm still asking the user to prove who they are to the client. Um, and, uh, because we still need to authenticate ourselves to it. So one password rather than a myriad of passwords, and it can be you know, whatever you're comfortable using. Uh, I developed some technology uh, which is unique as far as I've seen because it, is, it makes brute forcing a password much more difficult even than the traditional PBK DF2 technology is, and I'll show that to you in a second. Um, but we still, need to, we, we still need to authenticate the user to, to the device. The good news is, since as this gets adopted, the number of passwords you're responsible for, for curating decreases, you're unlikely to forget this one master password to the internet. And as you identify yourself to new websites, you get to uh, reuse the same technology as you go. So one of the problems is, if we don't have, as I mentioned before, a third party, then the end user has no recourse for their loss of password. As we've discussed this in various online forums for over the last year, you know, I've said, you know, how big a problem is that? And the sense is, well, people want the responsibility of, of ma managing their own identity on the internet, more, much more than they're willing to trust it to some third party. So, so the solution is to give them some tools to solve the problem of, I just changed my master password and I guess I typed it in wrong twice somehow uh, because now I can't get it again and now my entire identity on the internet is at risk. This is one of the issues here is with something this powerful, with great power comes great responsibility. So now this is managing your global identity, potentially, um, except in situations where you might choose not to have it do so. I mean, it's still up to you. This, the, the nice thing about this also is that because this is, there's no charge for this, no one's making any money, um, it's very low friction for adoption, um, it is able to live side by side next to traditional login and get used, hopefully, more and more as adoption uh, continues. So. We have this notion of a rescue code which has been added to the simple protocol that I described. Because users are just absolutely incapable of actually generating high entropy content, uh, the system does it for them. It's, it's uh, a 24 digit random number, um, which so it's like a credit card and a half in terms of number size, not unmanageable. Um, it is never stored in the device. It is written down or printed out and stuck away uh, in a back shelf somewhere because you, you absolutely don't need it. Hopefully, you will never need it, ever, ever, never need to use it, but it is your, it is your ultimate get out of jail free <laughs> number. Um, and it gives us, it ha, it, it's imbued with two special powers where it, it forgives us for forgetting the password that we do use every day in order to authenticate ourselves to our squirrel client. And it, it unlocks something additional called the identity lock that I haven't talked about yet. This was an additional feature that we decided squirrel needed uh, to, to solve the other problem of, okay, this is wonderful. The world knows me now by a unique pseudonymous tokens, uh, I can't be tracked, everything's great, but then malware gets into my phone and steals this. That is, how do we deal with the fact that, I mean, the reality of the fact that our computers are still not completely safe places to have these kinds of keys. The way the client works is 
the squirrel clients is it doesn't, in a, in a static fashion, have access itself to, this ma to, our, to our master key. That's decrypted using our password. Um, and because that can take a while, after we've authenticated ourselves once, I allow the user to use just the first n number of characters of their password. Because you just you don't want it to be burdensome, especially if it's your machine in your office at home and no one else has access to it. it you, know, you, you can relax the security in that setting. And so we're able to make that flexible. Um, no, nevertheless, we need some ultimate solution for what if bad guys get my identity. The identity lock is a, is a very cool protocol, and it's all documented at GRC. It, you, it's a, a unique application of Diffie-Hellman key agreement that, that works such that after your initial identity is created, there is information that the client carries that is able to create an association with the server, which it's able, it's able to make the association but, n but not authenticate it. That is to say, it, it, it's able to provide some, some, some information that if it absolutely became necessary for you to, to prove at sort of at a, at a next level your identity, the client can transiently be given that ability, but it doesn't store it. It's not in it, so it's not there to be stolen. Malware can't get it, and if, if they did get your identity, the worst that could happen is that until you changed your identity, you could be impersonated, but they're not able to change your identity. So you're able essentially to take your identity back for, if it ever got away from you from bad guys in a secure fashion. And you know, the, uh, <laughs> that actually makes sense to people like me and Dan, and I'm sure a bunch of you who are, who are comfortable with, with public key crypto stuff. Uh, diagrams are a little bit easier. Um, but, and I'm not going to go through how this works here because it's, it's a little bit of a brain fry. But it ends up that, you're, again, as I said, the, the, the idea here is that as, as you're going around during the day, visiting new websites and establishing, using Squirrel to establish these identity associations, it, we're able to do essentially a one-way process where the, what the client has can establish an association but, but with the agreement of the server, it won't allow it to be changed. That association can't be changed to protect us from bad guys unless additional information is, is brought in in order to allow that, uh, to make that possible. Um, so one of the offline attacks, which is obvious, is a bad password. Uh, say that your, your phone got stolen from you and you've got squirrel loaded on it. Um, we, want to, we want to make brute force password cracking as difficult as possible. Well, there are solutions for you know, PBKDF2 where, where you iterate a hash. The problem is those are things that run at server speed, and so they're still too fast. Um, Colin Percival uh, came up with a cool memory hard function called scrypt, where uh, the the password you use runs through a hash to fill an array of memory, and then, the, and then th that array of memory is an array of pointers pointing to other entries within memory. And so then you, you dance through this large amount of memory with the, the location you land on telling you where to go next, and that tells you where to go next, and that tells you where to go next. The point is that this is a, this is a very memory hard function. There's no way to either not give it all of that memory so that you're able in a reasonable time to follow the pointers through it once you filled it, or if you're, if you're going to say, okay, we're going to be fancy and not use that much memory, well, then you have to go crazy with computing what would have been in those locations otherwise. So, so that's a memory hard function. And we went one step further 
and chained those together using the, the standard uh, PBK DF2 uh, approach of, of generating a system where there is no way to run that in parallel. It has to be run in series because the output of the, of the first memory hard function was required for the second and the third and so forth all the way down. So what this means is that when you first put your password in, it takes, and again, this is user settable, but like five seconds of full-on saturated processing time in order to crunch your password into the key that decrypts the information that your client uses for authenticating. And there's no way to short circuit that, which means that anyone brute forcing this is gonna to have to take that much time giving, and in fact, we, we, we default to 16 megs of RAM, so that's way more than current FPGAs and ASICs have available, so you don't have to worry about Bitcoin hashing, you know, technology ma making this fast. So we've, we've made this very slow um, for offline attacks. There are a couple online attacks. Um, I referred to the client confirming that I wanted to log on. The reason we do that is that, for example, I, I could go to Joe's Pizza website and say, oh, look, they support Squirrel, and authenticate myself there. But this could be a malicious site, which has actually grabbed the code from Amazon and is presenting it to me on Joe's Pizza and so with, while I think I'm authenticating to Joe's Pizza, since I don't read QR codes natively, um, I can't see wh uh, what I'm doing. Um, so the point is that when, when we authenticate Amazon, the, 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 there's a, a four-pass cycle with the client. And among the things that Amazon sends back when it says, OK, here's, here's your status. By the way, we are Amazon.com, so your client verifies that uh, uh, verifies with you that that's where you are about to authenticate, so we solve that problem. Also, I mentioned that the, 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 uh, the that URL encodes the IP address. The, that's the IP address that asked for the QR code. So this solves another problem that, that, that is related to that, where some other site has, was the, originating, the, the original requester of that, and now your client is making the request. So that raises a red flag saying, wait a minute, the original request and the request for the, the, from the squirrel client should be from the same IP. So we catch that. Um, uh, and of course, we have the CA system, the, the whole uh, the, the whole security chain that we spent the morning talk about. And I, I realized the morning has been all about authentication from essentially the server out. And what I've been focusing on with, with Squirrel is authentication sort of in the other direction at the end node, proving that the user is who they say they are. Um, Squirrel uses, as I mentioned before, off the shelf crypto um, that is open source freely available, there are libraries for all the major platforms, and in fact, those are being used now. Um, the bulk of the work is in the client, which is where you want it, because we only need relatively few clients, but we would like Squirrel to be on all the server platforms everywhere. The server platform has almost no work to do. It has to do one API call to verify the signature. Otherwise, it stores a couple 256-bit tokens, and that's its job. And as I said, it doesn't even have to do that with very much security. Um, there's a bunch of projects on GitHub that, from people who have been following along with this. My client is done, and I'm just wrapping up the server side, so they'll go together so people will be able to play with this. An Android client has existed for some number of months. If you look for SQRL, Oh, by the way, I forgot to say, I, you know, secure, quick, reliable login. I broadened it a little bit beyond QR codes because it, you can use this without QR codes. Um, uh, uh, and so it's just beginning to happen. Um, so the question is, here's an idea. How is it going to happen? How is it going to get adopted? Why would, why would websites want to do this? 
Well, there are certainly a variety of websites in the world. There are sites where there is a very low tolerance to authentication. How, I'm sure all of us, I was about to ask how many, but I'm, I know the answer. All of us have gone to a blog and read someone's blog and thought, oh, I have something to say, and you hit re reply, and immediately you're asked to create an account. It's like, well, okay, forget it. I'm not going to bother with that. And so you don't. So you could imagine that those sites would be incented, as an example, to dramatically lessen the burden of create, allowing people to create pseudonymous identities, where you, you really doesn't matter who you are, but you don't want anyone to be able to impersonate you. And if you come back the next day or the next week or four years from then, you're able to still have your same identity. So you can imagine that there would be sites where, where it makes sense for them to do this, especially since it's free and it's open and there will be libraries that drop in in order to make it happen. Um, and then all users have to do is have one squirrel client. You just download it once. Uh, if you have multiple devices, you clone your identity in, into those devices and it's able to identify you. So it's, it's simple for the user. The user wants to, to use this rather than usernames and passwords. Sites where there's a low tolerance for account creation want to use it, and hopefully the thing could spread over time. Uh, and I think we know all that, and questions. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's in a coma from lunch. Hey, Steve. So uh, on the slide where you were talking about this uh, S-crypt for the, for the local password, where it's kind of an S-crypt plumbed into an S Yeah, this one. Um, so S-crypt being an adaptive hash function already has some tweaked values. Like, what's the advantage of this scheme over just tweaking those values higher? It turns out you can't go high enough. Okay. Um, you, you, if, if you went... It just, it's still too fast. Even uh, I, I set it up so that it's the least serializable possible. There are some, some parameters that, that are designed to allow it to be run in parallel. That's set to one, so you can only use one core. Um, but even, well, oh, I, I, you know, in a reasonable amount of memory, we would like to be able to run this in an Android platform or a smartphone platform where we don't have gigabytes of RAM. Um, but even so, it's still too fast. And, and, and the other beauty of this, I forgot to mention, is that what we would like to do is say, I want to encrypt my password such that it takes five seconds to decrypt it. So this is able to run until some amount of time passes. So you just sit there iterating S-crypt in, in, in small time chunks counting how many iterations of it you use in this chain, and then that count is stored along with the, the, the encrypted result so that whenever you put your password back in again, you rerun the chain for the same count in order to get the same amount of time. And of course, there's inter-platform variations. Smartphones are s slower than, than, than desktops. So one of the things you can do if when you move your identity over to a smartphone is it might take 15 seconds one time, like the first time, because your smartphone is slower, but then you're able to re-encrypt your password at five seconds or whatever a length of time you choose. So the idea is, 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 is it's much slower than S-crypt can go, and you're able to, it's sort of a, a, able to be a variable amount of time. Perhaps I missed it, but I, I didn't catch uh, what the operation make public key actually was. Is that an additional hash to the private key? What, what was that? I'm sorry? The, I, the uh, make public key operation? I yeah. I was hoping for more details on what that was. Um, I didn't want to go into it in, in like crazy detail. Uh, there is a, with elliptic curve crypto, what's, what, in fact, this was the original like aha for me, was when I realized that, that you could specify what the, what the private key was with elliptic key crypto. Instead of having to like, go find random prime numbers, um, it can be deterministic so that the private key can do, be directly connected from the output of that hashing operation. Um, uh, I use LibSodium, and th there's just like some simple APIs. There's one called make public key. 
and you, you literally, you give it any 256-bit value, and it spits out, it tweaks that a little bit for the private key, and then spits out the matching public key. And, there was, and then there's another API, sign. And so you give it a blob, like the URL, and the, the private key, and it spits out, in this case, it's a 512-bit signature. So it's, it's, a, it's sort of black box crypto, and it's been well vetted. Dan Bernstein, uh, who's a you know, renowned cryptologist, uh, has beaten it to, to, to death. And if you just Google ED25519, you'll find all kinds of references. More and more people are, are, are using this uh, solution because it's very fast as well. Yes, hello. Um, just a question on implementation. Yeah. Um, you know, using the example of the Android, is there any issues that could be compromised in a way where, like, how are they authenticating to the client on the phone? Right. Well, um, so that, that, that comes down to sort of where we are today. You, you, you absolutely still need to authenticate to your phone. Uh, Thanks to iOS 8, we can now, and apps are now able to use Touch ID on the fly in order to authenticate, if you trust that. Um, in, in Android, you might have biometrics, or you might have to still use a password in order to say, yes, this is me and not my son or a friend or a bad guy who just ran off with my phone. Okay. So, so, th so it's, it's still, es essentially, we've, we've pulled the problem of, of authentication in so that it's now a, one that is entirely local. We need to prove who we are to this bit of software that we've given the ability to represent us to the world. But that's a way different problem than giving individual identities to every website on the planet. And then on a, just on a standard PC, I mean, it looks like a name value pair that you pass into the, into the string. I mean, as, as a user, when I go to a site, example.com, how do I put the challenge in, like, from an uh, That's all transparent. Um, and uh, in about a week, I'll have a demo up and running. But so all the user sees is probably username and password, because I'm not expecting this to supplant traditional login, probably ever. But uh, the, the, the hope is that sites will see an advantage for making this thing available, because they have much lower burden of, of, of you know, themselves maintaining the protection of their customer's identity. And so you'll see username and password and this little QR code off to the side, which if this succeeds and, and becomes prevalent, people will recognize as, oh, I can use Squirrel. And so you scan it with your phone or you just click on it with the mouse. So the user sees none of this, this uh, uh, URL uh, gobbledygook randomness. It's all behind the page. And I mean, when you see it happen, it's sort of like, wait a minute, that's secure? Some, that, that, that's it? That's all there is? Dan? So, so we've got a scheme that's registered. Yep. Go to the page. So you go to badguy.com, and it gives you a scroll URL for amazon.com. Yeah. So just, I'm just speaking through the protocol and thinking if I'm understanding what happens here, why this shouldn't work. So that goes to the app. The app, does it alert the user? Yes. And the app says? The, 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 app, can, the app communicates with the server. Well, it's going to communicate with Amazon, but the right. user never logged into Amazon. It, the user it, was at badguy.com. Um, it, well, it communicates with Amazon. Otherwise, you don't authenticate with Amazon. Okay. So, so, the, so you go to badguy.com, and, they've, and, and he's giving you an Amazon.com URL. So the client connects to the Amazon server, and it identifies itself as Amazon in the protocol, okay. saying, hi there, uh, you're about to authenticate to Amazon. Is that what you want? And so the, the user says, whoa, wait a minute. No, I'm over at badguy.com. I don't want to authenticate to Amazon. And so we, we catch that, that okay. spoof in that way. Okay. So thank you.